Good. Welcome everybody who has joined us for this webinar, which is the last one in this spring term, and it's about Brazil. So uh, this is part of our webinar series, open seminars about Latin America. And um, this time, the title of this webinar is Forcibly Displaced People and the Right to Return, the case of Riverinos in Brazilian Amazon in Belo Monte Tam. So as you see from this title, there's going to be a lot about the situation in a particular place in Brazil, which is the Amazons, and a particular project, which was an infra infrastructure project and the consequences for the local inhabitants of the region. And with us today, we have a team of four researchers, I would say, uh, that are have been working in the project monitoring this displacement and are going to tell you a lot more about this project that has generated reports and publications and even more projects to, to come. So uh, this team is led by Ana de Francesco from the Foundation Getulio Vargas. And then uh, we will have Leticia Lopez Brito from this uh, foundation as well and Marcela Garcia Correa, also this foundation, as well as Satya Maya Pachinelam from the Institute of Housing and Urban Development Studies for Erasmus University in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. And each of them is going to make a, a, a presentation of different aspects of this situation. And after those presentations, we are coming back, we are gathering to make a discussion and questions and everything. And uh, as to practicalities, if you have any comments or questions, write them in the chat or in the questions and answers, and we will address them at the end of the webinar. So thank you for joining us and we hope to see you again in the autumn with new webinars, uh, hopefully. We don't know how is the situation going to be, if it's going to open and we will have normal seminars again, but for the time being, it will be webinars. Thank you very much. And I leave the floor to Anna. Please, Anna. Thank you, Edme. A good afternoon or good evening for everybody. As Edme present, we will discuss in this panel the Ribeirinho situation uh, in the, the forced displacement in the context of Belo Monte Dam. I will present the large contest. Then Leticia will talk about the research that we make with the Ribeirinhos in a, in a co-creation of our research methodology and application. Then Marcela will talk about the results of the, the, the research and Satya will explore more about the, the role of women in civil society organization. Marcela, you, you could uh, share with us the... Ah, here, thank you. You can go to the... To the second one, please. And well, this is, I, I use this photography from a Ribeirinho house. The Ribeirinhos, they are a traditional non indigenous population that live in the Amazon and specifically in the Shingo River since the end of 19th century and beginning of 20th century when they migrate to the region to work in rubber extraction. And in this house, you can see the, the small boat, the canoe, the straw rage where the manioc floor is made, the basis of the diet, everyday diet with fish and game meat and the yard full of fruit trees. This is a typical rivering uh, home, uh, embraced by the river and the forest. In the, in the third uh, photo here, 
é, exa, exaucione a Ribeirinha Woman, é, preparing a... Um, é, a uh, with her uh, daughters preparing to a, to a fishery. And it's an important re registration of how um, Ribeirinho's women, they work in all the, the economic activities and especially agriculture and forest structures and fish fisheries. Um, in the Ribeirinho social organization, the family, the house is the center of social organization. And the, is the, the minimum uh, territorial management unit in the house. So it's, it's just a little uh, immersion no? in this in the Shingo River. So you can see how, how people used to live there. Uh, in the, you can put, in 2011, the other one, Marcela, please. Yeah, in, this is the, a photo of Belo Monte Dam. The construction began in 2011 after a lot of protests in Brazil or in other uh, international protests because uh, Belo Monte was, was constructing a place uh, very um, rich in endemic species, biodiversity, and a place there is a lot of um, indigenous peoples, and even, even sacred place for, for indigenous peoples. And the construction of Belo Monte endangered the continuity of life of humans and non-humans in, in the in, in all this um, this area, uh, 900 kilometers of of Shingu of river area that the water was deviated, and we have a serious problem there in the, with deforestation in the last 10 years. We have more than 1 million hectares of forest destroyed. And this number increased a lot in the recent years. So uh, for all these this risks, impacts, uh, the, the project of Belo Monte then took 30 years to being approved in 2010. Uh, the next one, please, uh, Marcelo. And the, the impacts on uh, the environmental impacts is very uh, easy to, you can see it, but the, there is an, another devastating side of Belo Monte Dam. There is the impact on people's lives. For the construction of the dam, 40,000 people were displaced, especially in Altamira. And 1,500 were the Ribeirinhos, this traditional population that lived on the islands and the banks of Xingu River. Uh, the company uh, did not recognize the Ribeirinhos as a traditional population, as a, as a, as a subject of collective rights. Uh, in all the process, the right of self-identification, auto-definition auto was violated. And this resulted in the negation of their territorial rights, in the dispersion of the families, and the impossibility to continue of the continuity of their way of life. And so by denying the, the right of cultural identity and the right to choose the, their own uh, uh, development priorities, uh, the company did not propose a resettlement model that they can continue to live as, where, uh, as they do. So what happened in Xingu uh, is a clash, pass for me was a clash between two very distinct worlds. This is the, reset, the resettlement in the urban areas where some of the Ribeirinhos family were, um, were transferred. And uh, in, in this new neighborhood, soon we start to listen to many cases of illness and hunger uh, because they don't have any more the, the, uh, the way to, to live as they do. Most of the families receive just payments for what they will uh, they would lose. Uh, it, this, this account did not include the lands of common use, the resource of the yards, the forest, and the river. And uh, uh, when someone was not agree was the the amount, the company recommendation was always to go to the court against the corporation. And and then the Ribeirinho. Next one. 
the Iberinho, they, they start to, to, um, to look for institutions and for support for many institutions, university and uh, public uh, universities and prosecutors to, 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 to find to, to justice too, because they don't have any, any, any reparation strategy. So they beginning a new political organization as a collective. And they found um, the Riverine Council, Conselho Ribeirinho, that, that uh, represents all the communities that forced the, the displacement from the river. And it was, it was, a, it was a very, um, a process very uh, new in the region because they, they recognize all the, the traditional families that was displaced and begin to force the company to, to recognize all these families as impacted for the, uh, by the dam, as well as the, the right to the return for the, to the river. And they construct in many months, the, the, council, the river in council was, uh, was created by them in the end of 2016. And in 2000, uh, 18, they present a, a whole a new model of resettlement to the company and to the Brazilian government that that be that can make them go back to the the most um, close possible for the place that we live in the past and in the riverbanks of the river. And this project was approved by by the government be, uh, and and is, now is a legal obligation of the company vinculated to the operation of the, the hydroelectric plant. So they, um, you, se você passa, ai, this is territory Iberinho. They make this map with uh, the association of uh, traditional knowledge and scientific knowledge to construct this map of a new model of resettlement. And it was very important because even in a, in a situation that all the ecological and social dynamics were, was alterated, was them, that they who live in the in very close relation with the river and the forest, who can uh, design this, this resettlement in this new environment. Uh, so this is, the, this is all the trajectory of the family, I can resume. <laughs> as I can, and um, we have, uh, now we have this, uh, we have uh, like a hundred families that can return to the, the river and another two, 200 waiting the, the resettlement. And um, is, is the, the, it's important for us to tell this history because uh, it, we live in a very stable situation in Brazil that we we don't know uh, we can know, we can we don't know uh, how long we take to the implementation of the rivering territory that is so important to this family can resume their the way of life and they as they do in the past so. I think we, we can discuss this more in the in the end of the presentations. Thank you. I I pass the word to Leticia. Hello, everyone. Uh, well, in this contest that Anna presented, uh, the Center for Human Rights and Business of FGV, in partnership with the Social Environmental Institute, the Public Administration Government Center of FGV, and the Riverside Council, carried a project with the purpose to developing a monitoring solution for monitoring the resettlement of the communities on the Riverside banks. And the idea of the of this project, né, the monitoring, was to ensure the correction of the failures and the right abuses and violations which occurred in first uh, resettlement on the riverbanks, and also to monitor the conditions for recomposing the area of life uh, in the community. 
So the ideas behind this purpose was both to empower the community for decision-making process involving their guarantee of rights through concrete data about their reality, and also to be an innovative instrument for a case like this in Brazil, which is very common. Uh, however, as Anna told, the process are very dynamic and has its own time. And the resettlement was not authorized in time for us to carry out this monitoring. So we had to change the main objective of the project. And together with the community, we decided to carry out a diagnosis of the housing conditions and well-being before and after the forced displacement. So with that, we would be able to show the main impacts of the installation of the plant and the flow and gaps of the first uh, resettlement program. And also this would make it possible to improve the monitoring through indications, indicators that were constructed by the community itself because other servers and questionnaires and hazards have already been uh, carried out in the Riverside territory, but the community was not um, uh, their recipient and did not participate in the preparation of this, those resources. So uh, this diagnosis was the first opportunity to make data about their process and the phenomenon they went through. And it happened in three phases. The first one, uh, it was to discuss the methodology, the second for training and make the pilot application. And the third one was to define application of the questionnaire and the data analysis. So during the phase, the first phase, we went to Altamira to discuss the project with the, the Hebrew Council and the local partnership. And after some conversation miles, we decided to make the diagnosis based on a concept of development, uh, which is called Buen Vivir. This is, a, this is an idea of development uh, in the global sur that is rooted in the discussion of native people in Latin America. Uh, it, it beginning with the indigenous people in Ecuador and it's based on articulating more uh, four dimensions to diagnose the quality of life and well-being of the individuals and the communities and the four dimensions are democracy and po political participation common good and general interest citizen coexistence based on respect for diversity and collective harmony and harmonious coexistence with the nature, with respect for the life cycles, structures, functions, and adaptive process. So after those conversation walls, the counselors choose 10 essential dimensions to be monitored to ensure the recomposition of life. Uh, that was profile, education, communication, housing, work, family, leisure, food habits, community harmony, public policies, and past and future. And after all, it was 124 uh, questions that was distributed in the 10 blocks that I mentioned. And also in addition with the conversation house, the counselors took us for the homes of the families who were at a resettlement in the riverbank so we could feel the reality and talk to the families about the problems they were facing uh, during and after these, these resettlement. So we choose to make a diagnosis uh, in a, with a questionnaire that was census-based with uh, the global family, so 322 families. And as I told before, one third had already been resettled uh, in the, the banks of the Shingo River, and two thirds are still waiting their resettlement on the, the Riverside territory. And after discussing the methodology, the, phase two, the, the second phase was uh, when we elaborate the questions 
in constant dialogue with the, the council. Uh, we discussed the, the questions with them and redesigned it from their considerations. And then we have the second field with the local partners, the counselors and the local researchers to present the questionnaire and to the presentation to our application team and conduct the training. So the application teams were composed of three people, one counselor and two local academic researchers. And altogether, uh, there were eight file teams, uh, four responsible for applying the questionnaire in the urban area and four in the riverbank. And the most interesting thing about this training was that the counselors feel uh, comfortable to share with us the um, traditional knowledge. So it was a, a real sharing of traditional knowledge and scientific technology knowledge uh, among all the participants. And it was really amazing. Uh, and during this, this, yeah, go back one, please. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and we applied the pre-test questionnaire with uh, 12 families. And after we had some conversation with for feedback and, and the conclusion of the training. And during the, the third phase, uh, we applied the questionnaire that was revised uh, from the pretest and always in dialogue with the council. And it was applied by the teams over four weeks during November 2019. Okay, can go. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, it's important us to talk a, a little bit about the methodological challenges that we faced. Uh, the first one was that it was not possible to establish the exact time frames before the forced displacement to follow the changes in the, these people's lives. So the option that we had was to apply the questionnaire at a certain point in time, that was November 2019. Uh, that does not correspond to the, the, the time of pre-resettlement for most of the families, but also doesn't express the post-resettlement reality for uh, all the families. And after all, it was very positive because we could analyze the failures, the violations, and the abuses committed dur during this first uh, resettlement campaign. And how were the families living in the riverbank? So we could guide, um, guide improvements and guarantees for this new campaign that we will occur. And it, it was also possible to compare a lot of aspects of the people and the families that are living in the urban areas with the families that were already resettlement in the riverbank and see how the well-being and how the, the housing conditions were for both of these groups. Uh, and the second methodological challenge was not locating and conducting the interview with one third of the families uh, that composed the, the, the global uh, families of the, that will, will be part of the resettlement because uh, and we, we discovered that uh, actually it's a reflect of a uh, consequence of the, the forced displacement because it caused a geographic person and the rupture of the social fabric and then several families moved it to other municipalities and it was not possible to go to meet them. So it's a, it's an important uh, discovery for for the, the public policies and the company uh, face. And after all, uh, the diagnosis uh, was an important tool for the reactivation of the social fabric because the the river uh, uh, the council could revisit the families belonging to the Riverside territory and important too for training and empowerment uh, local agents and researchers, uh, straighten the hivering calls and also to product data about uh, 
about their lives and how it was affected by the installation of Belmont plant. And this data can be considered a baseline for thinking about uh, the development indicators of this community and for the elaboration of local public policies. So now Marcelo will talk a little bit about uh, the results of this diagnosis. Thank you. Hello, everyone. As Leticia was saying, uh, we conducted this study, but unfortunately, we could not reach all the families. So we, can, we could only reach uh, 180, 98 families that were interviewed in November. And of those, uh, almost two thirds were not resettled in the riverbank and one third was resettled. Uh, so we, we interviewed these families. Most of the respondents were men, although it doesn't mean that they were like the chiefs of the family or anything else, but they, they were the ones that responded the questionnaire. And most of them also were non-white, um, declared as we have, we have a category in Brazil that's pardo and indigenous people that's almost 22%. Um, as Leticia was saying, almost uh, 33, percent of the families um, said that they, they had urban houses and they were affected by the construction of the dam. 37.5% uh, received money as a compensation, so they did not receive any other type of compensation, just money. And 62.5% were resettled in accord, that is the, the urban resettlement, as Anna was saying. Um, there's a, a fun um, thing about this, this context that most of the families had two homes. So they have homes in their urban area where they could assess public policies, health, um, health units and so on, and also had the house in the riverbanks so that could, they could plant, go fishing and, and just live the, the life as they, they lived. So most of them, uh, had these two these two houses. Uh, also, 97.8 percent of the families uh, interviewed confirmed have a house in the riverbank before the construction of the dam. So the questionnaire did this um, this 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 strategy to try to map uh, the memories of the the Ribeirinhos about um, how was the life before the construction of the Belo Monte Dam. Uh, as we said, we just we could only monitor the house. The housing monitoring was only with uh, families resettled on the riverbanks. So we could see any violations or abuses that the, the Norte Energia, that's the company that was uh, responsible for that, did. So 18 per 80, 18% do not participate in the process of choosing the location of the resettlement, so they could not choose where the house would be. 94% said that the land was not clean, so it was like there, there was dirt, there was uh, a lot of trees and etc. 93% uh, received monetary help but for building their houses, so it's quite a compensation. It's not a compensation, but it's like a transfer to try to rebuild the, the house. 51% said that the new house is not efficient to protect them from the heat and also from the, uh, the wind. So that's the problem because the Amazon region is very hot. Uh, so so if, you, if you're not protected from the, hot, the, the wet, it's, it's, it's very, it, it's not nice to, to be in a house that's very, um, I don't know, in Latin America, everything is so hot. So uh, it, it, it causes uncomfortable, um, and comfortable, you, 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 I'm just, <laughs> I'm sorry. 38% said that they do not have access to piped water and 44% declared that there, there's no electricity. So uh, basic access to, to material things are not uh, yet uh, done. And also 93% said the, the, local, the localization of the riverbank settlement does not provide access to, po to social policies, so they are too distant from the center, the river center that is Altamira, 
Altamira is the largest municipality in Brazil, so it's very, very large, and it's difficult to assess social and other uh, policies, that public policies. 86% said that they do not have access to public health units, which is which is very it's very bad for them. 31% uh, said that the riverbank resettlement does not have agriculture space, which um, impacts in the way that they live, the way that they uh, deal with the land, with the forest, and the problems with the river and the lack of ways of transportation were reported as the main ones about the, this resettlement. Um, overall, we also mapped uh, work production and income. And as you can see, there's a, a quite decrease in the, the self-production of elementary goods, such as flour, vegetables, fruits, and chicken, and especially in the families that were not yet resettled. So they miss this contact with the land, with the, with, with the way, ways of production. So uh, as Anna was saying, the hunger and other things uh, become to, to be a problem in their lives. They were not before the construction of the dam. Uh, this graph shows how the, they decrease in income during this time. So before they said to us that they owned almost uh, here we have like a minimum wage and it was almost three minimum wages and now they receive less than one minimum wage. So it's a, a very, um, a very um, accentuated decrease. So it, it could bring to poverty and other process of social exclusion. Overall, our data suggests that as still many families that they were not resettled as Leticia and Anna said, that the riverbank resettlement reproduces some inequalities since transplantation and lack of access to public policies were the main problems reported. So these people could not assess uh, public policies should be included by the state or other organizations to assess their rights, such as health, housing, um, elementary, and, and et cetera. Families that were resettled reported problems in the housing structure. So their resettlement into the riverbank is not a quite good as it was before. So they could not uh, have the traditional ways of life um, built, built back. And income, work, and self-consumption were affected by the displacement. And traditional way of life were mostly destroyed. And we, can, we could see it in that way. So now I'll pass to Sasset to continue. Um, uh, hi, uh, now I'm, I'll talk a little about gender and um, we'll dive into the Riverine women's um, stories um, from the registration phase to um, some memories of, the, of, of uh, the process and to the Riverine Council. Are you guys, can you hear me? Is that okay? Yeah, okay. Um, so I selected a few quotes um, from my my interviews from the past. And um, in these quotes, you'll be able to identify what happened, what was happening and how they felt. And uh, yeah, okay, so um, uh, this slide. Um, during the registration phase, many Riverine women took the stand to negotiate to the negotiation process um, for the compensation. As Anna mentioned before, in the beginning of the presentation, the company used methods of power relation, minimizing um, the person that they were talking to, they were negotiating with, and um, hum uh, humiliating them. So this is um, a little bit of, of the interview. Um, the River Island women said that uh, an employee said, these people living in, in houses made of stilt um, are so demanding. Uh, you better take what, what we're offering or we're gonna sue you. So it's what Anna said about taking it to court and um, she battled back. She said, um, you can sue me. I am not in the rain, so it meant homeless. Um, I am inside my house. My daughter is inside hers. I am not asking for Norte Energia um, for a house. The company messed with me. What she meant was the company came and I was, 
I was fine before, but the company came and try and is changing my life. So we'll have to, so the company will have to do the right thing by us. Um, you get what you, uh, you get what we are offering to you. Um, so she, she, she um, answered back. So she said, she, she said to the company, you, you just take what, what you're offering me, which was um, a money compensation that was very, very low and buy the, the elopement, build the house, put my daughter inside, then I'll call, then you call me and I'll sign the document. Um, and then the problem it's over. So they, they um, yeah, next please. So throughout this um, process, they went through a lot of uh, depression and loss of identity, which became very common throughout the riverines. Traditionally, men and women, um, they work together as Anna said, also the, the relationship, the social relationship inside the house. Um, they work together in the, in the river and also with the crops. Um, this way women had their own income and they were independent. Because of resettlement, a lot have changed and they were mostly inside the house while men were outside working. And in this sense, as I said before, they lost their identity and, and they became dependent on men. So um, before this construction, uh, sorry, um, before this construction happened, we had a life. It was not the more, it wasn't not a very marvelous one, but it was a good life. Um, she was a fisherwoman, she survived the fishery and she was around two years not working um, with that, um, she became depressed, so she couldn't, she couldn't get up and work, and she said, um, today I might be okay, then tomorrow not, a week passes by, a month like this, it goes down the drain, so she was very um, uh, stressed and anxiety and, and, of course, very depressed. Um, next, please. Um, yeah, so when the company registered us, I started thinking I'm going to, to have to leave the house. So that was a very common thought throughout the women leaving the house, um, not knowing where to, where they were going, um, how would, how would they raise their kids in the city, knowing that the city is more violent than the riverbank. Um, they were worried about their, um, income. How would they survive? Uh, what about their crops and and their land? And they started not to sleep very well. So that's also um, that also increased the depression rate in amongst the the riverine women. Um, I came to the collective urban resettlement as an object, as you can see, it was very common. Um, and she didn't, she didn't identify to the space. So she, she felt very lost and vulnerable at that, at that um, location. Next, please. Um, oh, wow. Um, so finally, um, because all of that happened and the council was um, being built they were um, invited to be to represent their community community and many of them took took the stand as you can see these beautiful ladies they were they took the stand and they represent their 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 riverine communities and um and this way they found their purpose and daily responsibilities which before they had to stay inside the house, taking care of the family, and, well, the, the children and the household while the men went out to work. Um, but now with the River and Council, the daily routine changed and they were able to uh, go out for meetings. And they said that that helped with their, um, with their depression. And also um, it was a way of thinking of the future and planning for a better life for their kids. Um, so the Riverine Council helped them with their depression, as I said before. Um, 
there was a sense of belonging which uh, came back and empowered these women. And as I say empowerment, um, I read the first quote, which is, um, she, I have learned how to read after this happened, which is um, after the registration and resettlement, she felt um, injustice. So once the Riverine Council um, came into the, into, the, into the set, she, she started learning how to read. And now she, she's representing um, uh, her loved ones. And um, the other quote is, nowadays we are so busy with the council, we have to go out every day. And um, finally, we, um, I, th this last quote, I asked the Riverine women why she was still in the council since she had received her house already in the riverbank, she returned. And she said that we were fortunate to be, to have returned um, to the riverbank, but I decided not to stop until everyone from my community is back. Um, yeah, so this is the, the quotes that I, that I gathered um, for this, so you could feel a little bit of what they went through and, and what happened. And this are the, their voices. Um, yeah. Um, uh, next, please. And that's it. Um, thank you for your attention. Okay, Anna, do you want to say something uh, at, the, at the end? Or to round up all the presentations? You have to unmute yourself. Sorry. I just just want to um, say a little thing because we, as Marcela showed us, that uh, the, um, the resettlement, the riverbank resettlement, reproduce uh, inequalities is, a, is a the find of the, the research. And this is... Today, these families, they are just live in the, in the, in the riverbank. They don't have um, a place where they can crop, they can, they can plant, they can have agriculture. And this is a, is a very long um, struggle for them to, to, because they need the land as, as they don't need in the past. Because in the past, they survived from the river. Right? The Shingu have many fish. And now for them, it's very important to have um, an agriculture area to substitute the, the fish. And it, they make all a process of self-demarcation self of the territory. That it was a beautiful moment in all this process because it's, um, it's a recognition of the, the social memories that's, that are still in the, in the um, landscape. Even with, with all this process of of violence and violations and negations of their identity, either individual or collective identity. And, um, and they are st this is, is, is still happening. They are still there, the river in women's and, and men's. They are still in Altamira and Shiro River, um, finding ways to, to have this, this new land. And, and we, now we are uh, discussing with them how uh, we can uh, take inspiration from the, the, the climate emergency movements. I, I, I say it right, and the climate crisis and, and all the scientific strategies to, to cope in a planetary way with the, with the emergence of, of the climate as uh, to, to think about how they we organize this territory in a, in a way of, of uh, um, co, 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 how can I say, adaptive co-management. They can negoci negotiate, they need to negotiate with the, the state and the private sector in a, in a, in a, in a environment that nobody know uh, how and, and when we be a stable environment. So this is, uh, is what we are discussing right now. 
with the, the Ribeirinhos. I don't see any questions up to now, so I will put myself in the list and start with them because I would like to clarify several things. Uh, first of all, you speak about this uh, organization of the Riverina Council in order to get the rights to recover these livelihoods. And uh, when, when it was not very clear for me was um, from the um, from the surveys and the interviews you made and the presentation of the data you got, it, not all the families had lost uh, their their house because you said that only part of the families I don't remember the percentage uh, was said that they have lost or lost completely the house. That was one of the questions, but I'm going to formulate some more. Um, uh, as, as, as a result of this organization, then the, the, um, some of the families could get a house again by the river. Is that right? Not all the displaced families got this, got this housing on the river. They, some of them just stayed in this housing that had been built artificially and that you presented before, just to clarify that. And, and also um, regarding the women and, and the empowerment of these women, uh, how many of these women got uh, activated by this, uh, by this process? Do you have a, a large percentage of these women doing that or, or, or not? And now uh, perhaps a it's it's Marcela and Leticia who have raised their hand. <laughs> okay, we start with Marcela. Well, uh, as I was saying, that that percentage that was 84 percent, it was houses impacted in the urban area, but all of them had like the the that that thing that I, that I said that they have two houses. So they had houses in the urban area before, and they also had houses in the riverbanks. So uh, it's different because some of them declared that they have an impact in the house of the urban area, but all of them said that they have impact in the house of the riverbanks. So that's the, um, that's the different, it's, it's a, it's, it's like a, a, this phenomenon, it's, it's different because they have this, um these two houses that they live in so i i think that's why the data sh showed that the houses impacted in the urban area were 84 percent but all of them had houses impacted in the riverbanks mm -hmm. uh, that that's the first question i, I think mm -hmm. yeah uh regarding this that marcella told I, I believe it's important to clarify that uh, the array of life was uh, living with two houses because one that was traditionally uh, in the riverbanks where they could fish and cultivate and uh, exercise the, the array of life. And they had to, they had also a house in the, the major of then had a house in uh, the urban area for um, to sell the fish and to live for a while during the month to, to make commerce about the, the products they, they did uh, and, and they produced in the, the riverbank. And one thing that was um, really hard that, that North Energia did was uh, didn't recognize these two houses. So, as the families had house in the urban area, they only recognized one house and denied the, their traditional traditional way of life and their rights to be resettled in the riverbank. So this is one, one point. And I believe the second point is that even those people and those families that uh, had the, the first resettlement for the the Bank, 
uh, as Marcela told for, from the data, uh, the, the place they are living uh, is not able and adequate for their, their uh, recomposing their livelihoods, their way of life, uh, because of the housing problems, the access to the public policies. So even those families are participating from uh, of the the new campaign of resettlement, and now they can choose where to live and how their house can be, and also um, and also this resettlement uh, will be improved with the uh, from the problems we we saw that the first one had. So they they can. Uh, we can try to solve the, the, the first problems we, we solve. Um, I think the next question is mine, right? Or do you wanna, yeah. Um, can, you, can you please uh, um, uh, ask the question again? Cause I think I understood, but maybe, maybe I'm missing something. Yeah, uh, you were speaking about the empowerment of these women in some way through, through the process of organization. Some of them learn to read and write, et cetera. Yeah. And my question was uh, about what percentage of women got involved in this process and that you can say were positively affected by this participation? Okay, um, well, I have a percentage of um, those that were councils representatives, and I'm not. I I can't say um, in general the, the total amount and percentage. I can't say that because I don't have that number. Um, but I know that it was 50-50, So there were 28 representatives um, in total representing each area of the riverbank and um, 14 were women. Um, I'm not sure if 100% were satisfied or had positive um, outcome from, from being a representative. Um, but I know that the women that I interviewed, which were around uh, that, that are representatives that are counselors that were around 10, they were happy, they were, well, happy, they were satisfied. They were, mm. they felt empowered and, and they were eager to continue. Mm. Okay, um, I have more questions, but now I'm going to read a question from Karen, Karen Da Costa. And she says, thanks for the presentation. I'd like to know how is the mobilization of the riverine community happening today, especially taking into account the COVID situation in Brazil? Does anybody want to answer the question? I want. Uh, the Iberians are, are facing is a very hard moment. Uh, since the beginning of the, the, the pandemic, the pandemic. And they make a, a big effort in association with other organizations in the that have an actuation in the in the region to in the first year, not the last year, but the past year, to distribute um, food so they can stay at the in the countryside and no go to the cities to, to buy food. And, and what happened, uh, very interesting, is that many families that are, that was waiting the resettlement in the river bank, go to the river in an autonomous way and build the, the little houses as, as they can to protect themselves from COVID. Mm -hmm. And the... Um, the company began to, to make process of reintegration uh, de posse. Who can help me? Uh, property reintegration. The, the company uh, sent the police to these, these places to evacuate the Ribeirinhos, but they, uh, and, 
they uh, can have the support from a federal prosecutor and public um, public lawyers and now they have um uh como se diz juiz sorry have to make these translations judge the judge give them um they don't no one can can make it, the reintegration of the areas in, until the pandemia is over so there is this this very subtle and and, and discreet a uh, movement to of return to the riverbanks in an autonomous way because they don't want to stay in the city in the city they have fear of the disease and and a very uh, degradation of the quality of life you know, because this, we have in a situation in all the country of low income of the, uh, the population and the, uh, the higher prices in, in basic food and in this is a we have to say that we have some positive <laughs> things to, to to tell you is that in the this week this month and this week the riverine council has uh, started to um, facilitate the vaccination of all the riverines in the river and in the city so they are articulating with the the health secretariat and local NGOs to facilitate the logistic because in the Amazon the logistics the transportation have to go to the, the for one place to another is very uh, long and, and expensive. So the river in Kosovo is now working in this um, in this workforce to vaccinate all the the riverings uh, adults, and we we are very happy to see this. <laughs> happening now. So this is the mobilization. The mobilization now is to, to make the community health and protect in the way they, they can. I, I waiting for the other for other um, uh, questions. I would like to ask something else. Uh, when you were speaking about the before and the after the resettlement, you were also speaking about access to uh, public policies and health. How was the situation before? Did they have any access to health services before the resettlement? That means before the, the building of the, uh, of the dam? That is one question. And the other one is uh, this, um, this project was a was it a, a private company? Was it a, is not the state that is behind the building of this dam? Anybody? I think I can say some things about the public policy um, uh, monitoring. So, as Leticia said in the presentation, we could not um, precise a, a time zero as as we could say that. Uh, that is before the dam, but they reported as a problem before the dam. So mm -hmm. we could not see statistically if it was like a difference, but they said that it was because, uh, and I can say this, but they, they had boats, they had their own boats, which was also a loss. So they could, as, as uh, the Amazon region, it's very diverse and the uh, uh, the time to go to um, a health unit or a public policy, social policy, uh, it's it's always a problem, a logistic problem. Like in, if you go to the Tapajós River, the um, Rio Negro River, or the Xingu River, it, it is, it's always a problem to assess uh, health and other facilities. But it's in interesting that they brought that up in the questionnaire, it was like an open question and they brought that up. They said that the transportation was um, worst after the uh, the resettlement. Uh, so so we, we could not like precisely and uh, I cannot say for you in this in statistical um, sense, but it's something that they brought up. Uh, and if you, if you, if you can complete that answer. 
Hey, in the, in the forced displacement, they remove all the schools and the basic units of health. Mm -hmm. is, is the two most important uh, public equipments. And when the when the first campaign of resettlement began, they do not uh, rebuild these equipments. So for for a long time, they don't have any access to uh, health and education. Now uh, the the Ribeirinhos, they built themselves two, uh, three schools, provisory schools, but they attend just uh, small childs. Mm. Now they are they are building in, in, in uh, with the Vitória do Xingu municipality uh, the first permanent school in in one of the communities of the the this area, the territorio Ribeirinho, and. Um, but the, the health system, we don't have any yet, we don't have any unity be, uh, rebuilding in, in this area. And there, there is the access change a lot because um, all the, the, the city of Otamira is, the, is where they, they go to have access to education and to health and to service. Before the dam, Altamira was a, a city uh, that looks to the river. Uh, they have many palafitas, is a model of house uh, that is up the river. And, all, and, they, and then the Ribeirinhos have the, their families there. Is there. There was a social tie that interligate uh, all the houses so they can assess the city. And in the river, they find the houses of their families where they can stay where they can stay for, to have a support in the city. The, the first displacement uh, disrupt all these organization because we don't have more the houses in the river bank and, and don't have more the palafitas in the, in the um, urban area. The Ribeirinhos were transferred to far away from the river. So the, the access is, is, is was, um, was, Interrupt this connection between the river and the city is, is disrupted by the first displacement. So that we can have this data more about the public equipment that we don't have the past, how many, but mm. but is uh, is the all, all the mobility was impact in, altered by the project. Mm. Mm. Yeah, uh, and this cause this cause in the in the uh, subjective perspective. What Sacha says, Sacha say, says something about this, how uh, uh, women uh, cannot see, orientate, don't have orientation anymore, have this, this state of, of confusion and disorientation. I think this affects all the aspects of, of life, this disorientation. Yeah, I think because women, they have this very um, strong connection to the environment because they, well, what men and women, they both do, the, the river ends, they both do, but women, they're more connected because it's it's more related to the family and, and what is it, um, the kids and, and medicine and and these these things that are that are found in the backyard or in the forest and um, and it's something that there, there's this disconnection now. There's no, there, there's no river close to them now. I remember talking to one of the riverine women, and she was saying that the closest she gets to the river is when she turns on the shower because that's when she feels the water, and uh, that's, I mean, that's the sense of of um, loss of identity. That's that's how big it is. Mm. Leti said you were going to say something. Oh yes, I I were I were going to say that uh, regarding this, this problem of uh, transportation, when we went to Altamira and uh, talked with the families that were resettled, uh, some of them um, pointed a problem with the boat and the access from the river to the house. So there is a problem also because the, um, the land is, um, how can I say, 
it was not clean. And there, there's no a, a platform where they can put the boat and go to the house. So it's very difficult this access to from the river to the house, to the, to the land. And also with the lower income now in the river because they don't have access to the land to uh, do the agriculture and, and make the pro products um, and fish. Uh, they don't have money to, to pay for the, the gas to, to the boat to go to the city and has a, to have a, access to the public health. So there is another aspect of the problem uh, regarding the, the access to the, the public health. And something else I ask about the 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 company is it pri is it private? It was not the state or that owns the, the dam. No, it's a private company. It's a is a is a um, it was a concept. bidding, bidding, like licitation, bidding. Mm -hmm. huh? And and that was and the company itself was the responsible for resettlement. Yes. yes. Not the state. No. Not the state. It was the company. Is, uh, the, the river in resettlement specifically is, uh, it was not, um, it was not planning in the, in the, in the beginning. It was not it's a result. It was a result of the the struggle of the the river in council, mm -hmm. and is is very difficult because it's a resettlement that is in negotiation and constantly negotiation mm -hmm. was not was not plain was not in a plane. Uh, but is the is a obligation of the company, mm -hmm. vinculated to the the, the operation license. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So initially, they treated the riverines as, as dwellers, as rural or city dwellers, and they put everybody in the same location, the collective urban resettlement, and they did not um, um, recognize them as traditional Amazonian people. So they did not, they were not treated differently. Mm -hmm. So that's what happened it, in the beginning. That, that's, um, so the company was responsible for that first resettlement. Mm -hmm. Okay, there is there is a question uh, uh, now from the public. Is the Territorio Ribeirinho more far away from the city now than uh, the location from where they were displaced from? Uh, they no, it's, it's not so far, but they used to live on the islands, and the islands are all uh, flooded by the, the reservoir of the mm. dam. And now the territory Territory Iberinho is on the, the, the river bank in the mainland. Mm. So it's very, it's very it's, uh, close to the to the the river banks, very close to the island where they live in the past, but it's uh, in a very a landscape, very different, but it's a place close to the to the city. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and I have another question also regarding transportation, because you were speaking also that it was worse transportation. It was transportation before by the river? Was it done through the river and, and, and it changed afterwards? Yes, the river changed. Yeah, the river changed a lot. The, 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 the river now is is more dangerous. They have you don't say such a please help yeah. the uh, as ondas, as banzeiras, as they cut the. Yeah. So before, because of the islands and because of the rocks, um, the the river, the the wind would not cross through, so the 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 waves were not so big, and now because everything's flooded, there's no um, rocks. They they're not showing. When, when the the wind hits through and and in the Amazon the winds are very strong and and the the um, rain and everything is quite um, intense um, the 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 waves are very very high and and the boats sometimes they they turn they're not 
So now nowadays they're very scared. That that's the main thing they talk about. It's the big waves. Mm -hmm. Because many of them, um, which is funny, they don't know how to swim. Mm -hmm. it's, true. <laughs> it's so funny. I don't get it. <laughs> but okay. yeah, but before so the, there there were rocks, so you could you could hold on to it or or mm -hmm. yeah. And and transportation. So there are two seasons in the Amazon. There's the, the wet season and there's the, the dry season. The wet season, of course, the water goes up and it's easier to navigate, but the dry season. Um, before, of course, before the Belamonte, the, the, the water would go down and the rocks would show up. So sometimes from one place to the other, they would have to carry the boats to the other location so they could um, drive a little bit more. And, it, and uh, maybe in the wet season, a place uh, uh, from one place to the other would be two hours, but then in the dry, dry season would be, I don't know, maybe six or mm. Uh, yeah a little bit more so it's there's this dynamic uh, as well so now although there isn't this dynamic um because it's constant is the is a constant flooding they it's more dangerous mm -hmm. one man told to me uh, that he feels like he's a child again and needs to to learn everything again how to fish how to navigate how to how to live in, in the shingu because everything even the fisheries change because now is a there's a different river the the fishes change the, the comportment or or migrate to another uh, other places they have to use different artifacts. Yeah, because the landscape changed, and and the, and there's not there's not um, food enough food for the animals, so they have to migrate somewhere else. Mm. And and that brings another question: the the people who finally could resettle near the river bank, have they gone back to fishing? Have they been able to recover that that possibility? They are still fishing, but they don't have the same money income. They can fish to to eat, but they don't have more income as they have. As they used they to have increase before. a lot. Yeah. So they used to they used to um, make enough money, um, fish enough to to um, feed their families or even. Um, the other household close by and sell whatever they had in the in the street market every every week, but now there isn't enough to to sell, and if if there is enough, it's not enough to pay the e either the gas they have to buy or the ice they have to buy as well to put inside the phone. So it's it yeah also that um, that structure has changed as well. And they don't, yeah. Sorry, Anna. Uh, I thought you were gonna say something. <laughs> no, the scenario tends to be worse in the future because in the area of the reservoir, the places of reproduction and limitation, the fish is flooded. So they, they cannot uh, reproduce. They, Fishing and find I, I'm talking the point of view of the Hibedinos as they they talk to me. They don't have uh, places to reproduce, and in the the other the other side of the um, the dam where the the water was deviated, mm. the the uh, the the places of alimentation they, is um, dry. So the fruits don't the, the, the fishes cannot eat because the fruits uh, fall in the in the dirty and not in the water. So they are they are expecting a, a, a scenario even worse for the, the the next years. There was a campaign in this year that was a uh, freedom for the piracemas. The piracema is the reproduction of the, the fish in the river. And they make a movie. We don't want the freedom of our piracemas. 
so below they want to to deliberate the water mm. so so yeah so the pirasema is when the, the fish go up the the river and they and, and they re reproduce there so they can just go down and mm. live their lives I, th I think that's something very interesting here that's, uh, as, as I pointed out in the presentation, that's the rep reproduction of inequalities, because it was not like a very nice place to live before. It had the struggles, like inequalities as uh, is a poor, a poor community, net, but they survived. Uh, they lived, they have the traditional ways of living, of production, of reproduction, of social relations. And all of that was affected by the, the construction of the dam. So you reproduce some of the inequalities and some uh, problems of social inclusion that already happened, but they they like they get worse. Like, so if you cannot uh, get your boat and go to your riverbank house because you don't have a platform or because the river has too many waves or because the fish um, is not there, uh, your income and other types of poverty, because we could, could, could consider this as a multiple poverty scenario. Now it's reproduced, it's intensified by the, the construction of the dam. So I, I think that way. So it's not like uh, we, the state could not reach many of these people before, but they could live. They, they, they had their way of living, they, they were happy, they, they were making their life and the social reproduction. But now everything changed as, as the girl said, everything it's different now. So uh, when you, you were in a place of vulnerability, but you could um, live, you could, you could um, reproduce yourself in your life now, it's it's worse and and um, and and I think that's the the main dynamics that happens and the, all the the um, dimensions is is linked to this buen vivir that uh, Leticia was was talking about this this cosmology that you could live with harmony with the nature and stuff but now that's been cut it so um, it's more difficult. Mm. And it's also um, important to remember that the flow of the water is, um, it depends on the opening of the dam. So it's um, whenever they want to open, or whenever they have to open, um, the water can either be uh, a little bit more stable or run through really fast. So that also has an impact on their fishery um, because when, once they throw their, their net, um, and they usually leave there because they leave it there and they go somewhere else. And when they come back, the net might not be there and because the water took it. So they don't know also when that's going to happen. They used to know, they used to, to smell it when the water was going to go up or down, when the water was going to rise or not. And now they can't identify that. So it's what Anna said. They, it's, it's like they're kids again. They're trying to understand the, the, the environment as, um, again, um, trying to survive through the, the, this different environment. And it affects not, not only the fishing, but also their house because uh, the agricultural area is um, floated by the, the river when it's, when it's go up and they are not advised by, by the company before. So they plan the things to eat, to sell, and then suddenly it goes down with the river. Perhaps a, 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 a question that would uh, uh, be a little bit foolish, but do they see any kind of positive effects of this resettling or of this building of the dam apart from the process of empowerment of the women is there any kind of effect which is not as negative as all that you have given us that can they I were in this, this field themselves can i i think everybody needs to respond to this question but can i say there's a little story very short story 
é de ribeirinhos é, é construct a, a school in the community the, the school the school don't have uh, electricity mm. so uh, they need the uh, some they need electricity it's a school and then um they were discussing with the company how to to no, it's not, it was not the company it's a, it's a, it was a meeting in the, the river in council discussing this question of the electricity in the school and then um a very important woman in Altamira, Antonia Mello, is a, is a, she's a um, uh, woman rights defender and was there. And she said, I have a project to put uh, solar panels in the school. And they say, oh, perfect, because of Belo Monte, for, from Belo Monte, for, from North Energia, the company, we don't want even the electricity. I think we, this is very symbolic for me. Mm. If you have some a uh, positive result of this construction, I don't think we have. We don't have even electricity. And in, in their houses, in the resettlement they were given, was there electricity? No, in the urban area, yes. And then we have many problems because because they don't have money to pay the bill. But in the river bank, no, electricity. They don't have electricity. No, they don't have. And it, it's a problem also because uh, now that the young people had access to the city and the internet and other ways of life, uh, they don't want to come. They don't want to go back to the to the river bank uh, if there is no no internet, no, no energy and, and nothing because they had access to another way of life. So there, there is a, a, a risk of uh, the future of the community because if the young people doesn't want to come back and continue this way of life that was disrupted. Yeah, so there, there is a problem also. I think that's uh, something that, that's very precise to, to comment that Altamira, as I said, is the largest municipality in Brazil and it's very violent. I, I think uh, Sacha can talk more about that, but um, it, it's very violent, like for women, uh, sexual, um, sexual violence. Um, and I, 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 it's not about our diagnosis, but I read something about like women that were violated by men that moved to Altamira to construct the Belo Monte Dam. So, uh, and all other types of violence, including drug traffic and all, all stuff. So this impacts also the life of Hibetinos that were used to live in harmony with their nature, with themselves, social relations. So the conflicts in the community had also increased. So I think there's no good impact about this dam. Uh, I think when um, it, it changes everything, it changes the way they live, it changes the social relations, it changes how they they live in community and with the nature. So it impacts all genders, but differently as we could see. And I think the violence is something that we could not diagnose in our, our study, but it's something very important. Uh, mainly in the urban area where everything happens and most of them i don't know it's an hypothesis but they were not involved in violent violent uh contests before but now they are so i think it's nothing we could say that there's one thing that's good as electricity but i don't not even this because the the not not even this because they don't have access or they have to pay uh very high uh, bills to to have access to that, and I think uh, I, I don't have this data precisely, but I think it's thirty percent of the families depend on Bolsa Familia. There is a um, mm. cash transfer program for poverty people in Brazil, uh, poor people in Brazil. So it's quite. Uh, I think they have more uh, thing things to worry about. They've lost everything that they could. Uh, 
think of having the project of life that's very important too i think this jam made very uh, bad bad impacts in their lives okay there there is there is uh, another question from eva sherva this mega project has been very polemic as far as i know and took a long time to approve have there been any democratic participatory process in the region, I guess, to approve the construction of the project? You're muted, Anna. Uh, they, don't, they don't make the public a consultation with the indigenous people was not made. In this uh, legal disposition in Brazil, maybe Leticia can say better than me. They don't make these consultations. They make all public audience, public hearings, mm. but uh, they were not effective because it was um, badly organized. People cannot uh, um, have access and information before this audience. Uh, is a, there, there is a lot of literature about this, the, this, uh, the non-participation of the population in the license process of Belo Monte Dam. Mm. Okay. Leticia, you have your hand. After before, after I... Well, they, they, they saw the... the the project as a very participatory um, kind of project, but they use a very top-down approach where they, they the, as Anna said, the, the meetings were just uh, a presentation and there were a hundred um, people in the audience watching. So there weren't um, a conversation to, to find a balance point. So, yeah. It's, it's for this reason that the river in Kosio is so important because they, they, they force the participation. They, they, nobody give a microphone to a Ribeirinho and say what you're feeling. No, they need to, stay, to make a political organization months and months and years before they can have a place of protagonism and a, and a, they, that uh, their, their voices can be really took into consideration. For many, many, many years, all the, the Ribeirinho says was uh, negated and even ridicularized by the company. And always we need to find, for this question in the, with the fish, né, the degradation of the fisheries, we need to, to ask the support of scientists. The scientists say the same thing that the Ribeirinho say, but the Ribeirinho don't have voices. Mm -hmm. So was a, was a pro, the, the political organization for the participation in this process was, a, was something that depend of the organization of them and don't, it's too, too, um, they need to to alterate the, the procedments of the, the company and the state because uh, as the, the expression Satya was it was a top-down mechanism of it's not consultation, it was just information and even information because to have access to have a, what was very hard to have access uh, what is uh, information access access. Even if it's a, it's a, there is a legal provi provision in Brazil of sharing information, in the case of Belo Monte, it was very hard to obtain information. And it's still very hard to obtain information through, from the company. From the company, still very, very hard. Yeah. So, uh, exactly. Because I'm doing my PhD, I'm sending them emails and I receive very short answers. Hmm. Yeah, for, for indigenous and com, uh, traditional communities, we have the free previews and informed consulting that is uh, uh, 
pa rin the granted in the 169 uh, International Labor Organization Convention and also in the American Convention of Human Rights and now in the United States, uh, uh, United, States no, uh, United Organizations uh, uh, Convention. So uh, for, uh, from, uh, we have to, to, do, to have this uh, public hearing, but for indigenous people and traditional people, uh, has to have also the consultation and when they are, uh, if they, they are, will be displaced, it has to have a consent about this and a planning about where they are going to be, how will be the house and how will reconstruct, reconstruct their lives and nothing of this happened. And also there are, um, there are, uh, some riverine that that says that their house were they took fire in their house to destroy it and before they they stay and they before they could negotiate on uh, the, the another house so this is a a, a serious problem good anybody else who wants to ask or comment on this situation I have another question, a little bit more on the situation uh, in Brazil at large. Has this situation with the Riverino Council um, worsened during the time of uh, the, this government, Bolsonaro government, or has there been any change since the, go since the government before to this one for this community? Uh, yes, I think it is reflect on for, for these communities. Um, I think the is harder now to obligate the company to to implement all the the reparation that that uh, the companies already uh, have obligation, but it's harder to to have uh, pressure from the government on the company. Uh, in the local, the deforestation increased a lot, a lot in the Xingu region and the um, gold mine, illegal gold mining increased a lot. And um, this is, is, a, is a land pressure and in, a, in the, um, Ecological pressure. We have the pollution no, in the rivers. That is, we is an alert that is occurring now, and we have also a, um, a, some farmers as the sectors of farmers of the region very aligned with with the federal government that they really don't want a precedent because the, the, the riverine territory is, is the first traditional, uh, the recognition of a traditional territory in Brazil. We have the indigenous lands and the quilombo, okay, terras de quilombo. I don't imagine how to translate this to English. No, I think it's uh, uh, and just black people, quilombo is, I don't know. But, but we have a uh, uh, legal structure for the indigenous lands, but not for the traditional communities. It, it is, was the first time that this was in implementation, in, in discussion uh, in the federal government. And this is not even more a discussion mm. with this new configuration. So we don't, we, and we don't know because this is everything very, very, crazy here so we can, we cannot expect what what will happen next year they are trying to change many legislations the license process of the large structure projects are under debate there is a 
uh, red bird in the yard. <laughs> Black, no red. Paul, oh, this is getting a you, you have something to say about the, the contest, uh, maybe something positive? <laughs> Anybody else who wants to add something to what Anna has said? I'm, I'm thinking because I, I, I think that uh, the Bolsonaro figure, it's not only about what, because public policy is not only what you do, it's also what you do not, what you do not do, right? It's the, um, the absence of doing stuff. So I think that's Anna, that is what Anna said. So this neglection, I don't know how to say this. Uh, if you can help me, Sacha. Neglect, neglect. Yes, the neglect of of these demands of traditional people in Brazil, uh, and as as we can see, like the Amazon is being destroyed more than ever uh, with the Bolsonaro government. Uh, so I think that that has an impact, and. Once more, if is there something positive about all this process, is the Ribeirinho uh, Council because they they have this protagonism. They they can they they build us a political and social base to demand from themselves to have a voice to uh, be heard because in Brazil the inequalities are so big and so intense that they are not even heard never. So even the, the legislation uh, guarantees the right of these people, they are not heard. So this uh, union of them, this uh, basis construction, this social construction is very important. I think it's the only thing that is good about all of this. It's that they could uh, took the narrative of their own lives for once, even if it's a uh, context of many violations, but that they are uh, facing this and they are uh, telling their own stories. And, and I think this is very important. Yeah, Marcel, that's actually good because they were, they were um, treated as invisibles and now they have a voice. So that's, that's actually um, a good way to see it. Sorry, we don't have any more questions. Uh, so do you want to add anything that uh, you forgot or you think it's important? Any of you? Um, I think it's important to remember that um, the Belo Monte Dam is just uh, 60 kilometers from Altamira and um, the collective urban resettlement pays uh, a very, very high um, uh, uh, electricity bill. Mm. And it doesn't even come from Belamonche, it comes from another dam. Mm -hmm. So it, that's also um, good to, to remember also because um, the riverines, they, they don't have um, the income they used to have. So their, their understanding of um, um, administration of money is very different because before they would rely on their natural resources now they cannot only rely on the natural resources they have to rely on also managing money and income and and what goes and what comes and they don't have this um, knowledge so that's also something that the the company should have thought of um, of course they should have thought of many things but that's also a thing that they should have thought of and and uh, impoverishment is is very high now amongst the the riverine because i guess um impoverishment is is if you think of of money wise um they they've been always been um uh poor or a low income um community but they had a life they had um a livelihood they had they had their system, they could rely on each other, they, they were never hungry, they had food on their tables. Now, sometimes they don't even have um, uh, a bag of rice or beans, which is very uh, a common food 
in in a Brazilian table. So um, that's that's also important to remember that uh, they have to understand how to manage um, their money, which is which is uh, it's it, it wasn't their reality before. They have to pay a lot of bills, and and the company does not help in that sense. Mm. So could you say that this experience that perhaps is only one of many other uh, has to be reframed in the sense of mm, economic development, growth, and the evaluation of poverty? I think if we're talking about the river Rhine is not, not only economic, but also un understand and respect their, their, their identity and traditional um, um, way of being. So it's not only economic, but it's also their relationship with the environment. Mm -hmm. That's also something that has to be respected and, and continued throughout. So that's what the, the Territorio Ribeirinho is trying to do, right? Is, is to reconnect them to, to what they lost and and it's not it's not only um, 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 economic. It's also um, uh, a relationship. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. social, cultural, and exactly. It's, and... it's all the dimensions. Mm -hmm. So yeah, economic is very important, but it's not everything. I don't know what what I was trying to say is that these. Um, problematizes in a serious way what is development oh, yeah. and what is poverty that's yeah. what i was thinking yeah, yeah of course of course which is a whole issue in itself yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah and i think i think it's a as i said it's a multi-dimensional poverty uh, which is mm -hmm. like a an approach that the world bank and mm -hmm. united nations uses but the Buen Vivir, I think it 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 tries to explain this in a better way because it's in a global sort, but also because um, it, it gets these elements. There are sometimes subjective elements are not material elements, such as a livelihood and traditional way of life. So I think this is important for us to think. It's not only poverty, material poverty, it's all kinds of poverty and in a way as as such as said it's like almost a soul poverty because you lost everything so you just get so too sad and don't want to do things anymore as you as you did so you you lose everything yeah so maybe in this sense like the three pillars of sustainability economy social and and um, environment i think culture is like on the top well in my in my view of course i don't i'm not saying for the girls but in my mm -hmm. view for the river lines it's it's on the top of the list okay thank you very much i don't know if anna wants to say final words before we close you have to unmute I want to thank you, Edme, for the opportunity the and country. to Sacha. It's the first time that we have this discussion, we from the SEGI, the, the center, and Sacha, so thank you. And um, I'm, in my PhD, I, I, I analyzed the Belo Monte as an as a ontological struggle, mm. the logic of the development did not um, include another way of existence mm. so i think this is the the center of the, the place of future and more than future is a is a word is a, is a, 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 a um, realities no ontologies they are in conflict and iberinho can live with other ontologies like they they have neighborhood relations with indigenous people different kinds of indigenous peoples for many years. It's not just a Pacific uh, relation, but 
uh, is a, a regime of coexistence. But the, the ontological regime of Belo Monte them do not um, um, uh, have space for any other way of, of live the life of mm -hmm. any other uh, kind of world. Mm -hmm. And so this is not a way of development. We don't need this anymore. Very good. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Marcella, Sacha, Leticia, and Anna for this wonderful presentation. I myself have learned a lot, and I think that the people who were here learned also a lot about all the details of this very, very important and interesting experience. And I hope we can meet again some other time and have a discussion with the Riverinis themselves. Perhaps yes. in a later occasion. <laughs> okay, so thanks a lot. Thank you very much. And thank you for this collective effort of, of, of presenting this. And thank you for, uh, to the public. And as I said before, if you're interested in getting the link of this recording, I hope it will work, uh, you can write to me. So. We will put it uh, in, in somewhere so you can you can have the link for that. Thank you very much, everybody, and uh, for the people on this part of the world. Good evening for you. Good day. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye, ladies. Goodbye. <laughs>